meter. That's what droplet transmission. I can see your hand. That's droplet transmission. That's aerosol. It will be an aerosol later on down if, the line. If it right? was down the line. More. Down the line. When it combines with dust in the air, like someone's sleeping, okay, that's now your aerosol. But if you're real close like that, this is spray. She sprayed. <laughs> then when you sneeze, don't sneeze into your hand, right? No, no, no. Do that. Or get a little tissue, right? Because if you do this in your hand, you start touching things, right? And you leave it for somebody else. So sneeze right here, right? Because you don't touch things with the inside of your elbow, right? Or if you got tissue, sneeze into your tissue. What's your question, Katie? What's the difference between typhoid fever and typhus fever? Are the they the bacterium. Same? Okay. Do they cause the same thing? No. Okay. Typhoid fever is caused by salmonella. Okay. Okay. Typhus, I forget the actual bacteria that causes it, but it actually uses a vector, uses a tick to transmit it. That's the difference. Okay. Typhus is typhus, typhoid is typhoid. Completely different, completely different bacteria causes it, and completely different modes of transmission. Mm -hmm. Salmonella is typically food or illness, okay? Typhus, you need a I tick okay. to bite you. Okay. okay. Now here is showing wow. you basically improper refrigeration. So we've got fresh meat, and normally we like to keep fresh meat cold because we've got lots of organisms present. And as long as we keep the temperatures cold, right, those microorganisms won't grow and multiply in the meat. Hot. It's a hot oven there, so if you eat that, you may get sick. You may. Okay. Possibility. Possibility. God bless them. Here are arthropod vectors. We don't have to go through this. That was what, chapter 12, I think, right? I talked about ticks and fleas and mosquitoes and flies. We can keep going. We'll talk about that already. Oh, this is nice. So how do you classify diseases? Well, you can classify diseases in multiple ways. First one, we'll get into more of this at the last part of this semester. Because the last part of your semester, we'll talk about diseases according to what? Body systems, right? It's a textbook, what? Microbiology with diseases by what? Body systems? Okay, so we'll do that. Do they talk in the respiratory tract? Your genital tract, reproductive tract? Okay, so we'll talk about that later. How about their longevity or severity? This is talking about, okay, things like acute versus chronic diseases. We'll talk about that next. How about how they spread to their host? Are they communicable or non communicable? This again, I'll talk about on the next slide. And the last one, okay, the effects on populations. Whenever you talk about populations and diseases, that is epidemiology, okay, got it? So epidemiology, you're talking about the frequency of disease, okay, and where is it spreading, what's the cause of disease, right? What's the frequency of occurrence, and where is it, right? Whenever you're talking about populations and diseases, that's what epidemiology. Now, these next little terms goes here, right? Their longevity and their severity, okay? Right here. Okay, so what's acute? An acute disease basically happens fast. In other words, you get your symptoms real quick. The symptoms typically are severe, so a quick onset of diarrhea, right? A quick onset of throwing up. But then after a day or two, it's all done. So in your acute diseases, You've got basically a short incubation period, right? The onset of disease is quick. The severity is usually severe, but it's over really quickly. So think of all your foodborne diseases, right? Typically over within a day. You may have a bout of diarrhea in one day, and then after that, it's all done. They are acute. Quick, fast, and in a hurry. Also, the cold. Even though the cold is not typically severe, your common cold will also be placed under acute because you get it quickly. The symptoms are not that severe, but within a week or so, you're past your cold. So that's also under acute. Now let's look at chronic, okay? A chronic disease, okay, has a long incubation period. The symptoms are, typ are typically not severe. Say typically, there's always exceptions to the rule, but typically they're not severe, and they last a long time. Make sense? Acute, what? They're very quick. After a day or two, you're done with that disease. But in chronic, long incubation period, symptoms not that severe, but key here, it lasts a long time. So think of things like TB or leprosy.
hepatitis. Okay, all these things, what? A chronic, they last a long time. Okay, subacute. Subacute basically goes between acute and chronic. That's it. So subacute goes right here. It goes in between acute and chronic. In terms of the severity of the disease, in terms of how long it lasts. So bacterial endocarditis, for example, basically that's a bacterial infection of the heart valves. That would be an example of a subacute disease. It just goes right in there. Bacterial endocarditis, in other words, infection of the heart valves. Okay, that's an example of a subacute disease. How about a latent disease? That sounds familiar. You talked about latent viruses, I think. Well, they're not slow. They tend to be inactive. They're inactive. So if you're talking about a latent disease, like a latent virus, they are inactive for a very long time. You have the virus, but it's not doing anything. It's just hanging out in your DNA. Like HIV, for example, it's hanging out with you. Or herpes, okay, that's even worse. So with herpes, you can be exposed to the herpes virus, and you would never know you have it. Herpes, just like HIV, it incorporates into your DNA permanently. So there is no cure for herpes. There's no cure. No cure. You have it, it's with you forever. You may not know you have it. Until so one day, maybe 10 years later, you finally have a herpes outbreak. And you're wondering, well, where did this come from, right? You don't even know when you're exposed to it. Because herpes, like HIV, is latent. You're exposed to it, you have it, and symptoms don't show up because the virus is inactive. And you know about herpes. There's two forms, right? Cold sores and genital warts. Herpes virus. Simplex 1, simplex 2, okay? If you have cold sores, you know they come and they go, right? Because you will always have that herpes virus. When you don't have a cold sore, guess what? That virus is inactive. It's still with you, right? It's latent. But when you have that cold sore, that virus is now activated. Hit it, Faye. What's stress? Stress, for example. When you're stressed out, or if you have a cold, for example, that's why they're called cold sores. Because if you're already sick, for example, your immune system is kind of already working on something else and allows the herpes virus to be activated, or if you're stressed, it can be activated and come out. Okay. Now, these next two terms, communicable and contagious, okay, they fall right here. So how are they spread, okay? How are they spread? So communicable versus non-communicable and contagious. So what is in communicable, right? Probably community. So a communicable disease is able to be passed from person to person. Now keep in mind, not all infectious diseases, not all of them, are communicable. Some are, but not all of them. So most of these is like HIV, right? Like herpes like the cold, like the flu, okay? They are communicable, meaning you can get it from somebody else, makes sense? So as long as you can get the disease from another person, it is said to be what? Communicable, right? Community. But what about non-communicable diseases? And I mean infections, meaning they're caused by a pathogen, right? In your non-communicable disease, they either arise outside the host, meaning you stepped on some rusty nail, you've got tetanus, or it came from your normal floor. In other words, in a non-communicable disease, it's an opportunistic pathogen because it did not come from another person. So I talked about what? Uh, tooth decay, right? Cavities it is basically what? A bacterial infection, right? Did I explain how cavity works? Right? Bacteria are making biofilms, right? They're eating your food. They make acid. The acid wears away your enamel. You've got a hole in your tooth, correct? But did you get that bacteria from your neighbor? No. They're in your mouth, right? Correct? But what about pimples? I talked about propionic bacterium acne, right? You didn't get that from, from Leon, right? No. You already have it on your skin. And sometimes they can cause what? Acne. So this, is that okay so far in terms of a non-communicable infectious disease? It's caused by a pathogen, but you didn't get it from somebody else. You got it from maybe stepping on something like a tetanus, or it's your own normal floor, but now they're taking advantage of you. Let's say you're taking antibiotics, for example, or you're sick. It gives them a chance to what? Make you sick. Now what is this all about? Contagious. 
Now, is contagious under communicable or non-communicable? Contagious. Communicable. communicable, okay? What's the word contagious? What does it even mean? Easily. It can spread easily, okay? It can spread easily. So things like chicken pox, I've had it, right? And most of you had it too, because most of you, or at least my age or older, right? Everybody in here probably had chicken pox, because it is highly contagious. Now, the younger people in here probably never had it. Because by the time they came along, they got the vaccine. We didn't have that in our day, right? You just had it, okay? If your brother had it, you had it too. Your cousins had it, you got it too. It's just contagious. I got the scar right on my forehead. You still got, oh, yeah. and those scars never go away, no. Jeff. I got some on my back. They don't go away. These younger ones don't know about I was like two. They're like, don't pick at it. I'm like, pick that. Goodness gracious. So contagious means it's communicable, right? But it's easily what? Passed along. Okay. Oh, gosh. That is a summary. What do you have to know, right? Acute, right? Chronic, subacute, latent. Communicable, contagious, non-communicable. Those guys, what I just mentioned, those guys you should know. Only those guys. Okay. Now, everything now is going to be what? Epidemiology. In terms of populations, we're tracking disease in terms of incidence, occurrence, frequency. Where are they? And what is their cause? So all that is what? Epidemiology. It's like detective work. Pretty cool. All right. Now, in terms of frequency of disease, we can track two things, incidence or prevalence. Now, incidence is what? The number of new cases. So number of new cases is what? Incidence. This is very different from prevalence. Prevalence just means what? How prevalent is a disease in your community or in your population? So prevalence is what? The total number of disease cases, total number, including the new cases in that given time period, okay? These are two things you can track. Keep that in mind. Incidence is the number of new cases in a given area, in a given time period, like say in a year. Prevalence is the total number of cases. You are including incidents in prevalence. Got it? Okay, no. Now, for example, on this chart, looks like we're looking at prevalence and incidence of AIDS in the U.S., okay? Now, note that you have two different scales. You understand why? Let me ask you this. Why must incidents always be lower than prevalence? So why must, why must incidents be lower than prevalence? Incidents count, count just every occurrence. Incidents count every occurrence. All the instances added up. Okay, exactly. So incidents is always what? The new numbers. The new numbers you're counting. Prevalence will include all those new numbers as well as the ones from before. The, old. the older ones. So that's why over this same scale, on this y-axis is the instance numbers, right? 20,000, 40,000, 60,000. But on this y-axis is the prevalence number of what? Some 1,000, we saw what? 100,000, 200,000, make sense? So you may be misled, misled by looking at this graph and you say, oh wow, so back in what, 1993, right? We had a lot of incidents of HIV, right? But low prevalence, that makes sense? No, of course. If you look at 93, right, we had about, about almost 200, 180,000 cases, right, total in that year. But in terms of new cases, okay, wow, almost about, maybe almost close to 75,000 new cases that year. See how that works? Okay, no. Now, what is the take home message here? Who knows the take home message here? Do I want you to know actual numbers of Shook analysis in the U.S. in 2000. Gosh, no. What's the take home message here? Prevalence is more than seasonal. Mm, it can be seasonal. We're looking at years, okay? This is a map, right? Mm -hmm. Is that a map, okay? This is a bar graph, correct? Okay. This is a line graph. Okay. So the summary here is what? If you are an epidemiologist, you can use multiple ways, like a chart, like a map, like a bar graph, like a line graph, to represent data. Okay, that is your take-home message. But why would they do that? Because basically, you're looking at the same thing, you 
you really are. It's just different mechanisms of doing that. Because they're trying to look for patterns in the data. They are detectives, right? They have to look for clues in the data to figure out where did this disease start, right? Or in other words, or what is the cause of this disease? They are detectives. And the multiple ways they've got to show data, the more likely they can see a pattern, right? And they can see a pattern, it gets them closer to their answer. So far so good? Okay, great. Matthew says yes. Good. All right. Now what is this showing you? Hmm. All of these are epidemiology terms talking about the incidence or prevalence of disease. Okay. Now over here, this map in the Western Hemisphere looks like this disease is said to be endemic. Now the shaded region is the normal range, and the dots are the new cases. So here is endemic. Okay, so in your endemic, that particular disease is pretty much there. It's prevalent in that community at low numbers. They don't tell you numbers here. It's endemic. In other words, there's always some low number of infection of that given disease. Basically, you can't get rid of it. You have very little new cases of it. Now, I'll give you an example of an endemic disease so you can understand what this map is showing you. Okay? So in some countries in Africa, okay, malaria is said to be endemic. In other words, you take Cameroon, for example, and I can use that because my husband's from there, so it's okay for me to use Cameroon. You can take Cameroon, and if you look at it, it'll look something like this. It'll be all shaded, which means if you go to Cameroon, you may get malaria. It's as simple as that. Why? Because it is endemic to that area. So if you go there, you may get malaria. Makes sense? So far, so good. So it's, it's, all, it's always there in low numbers, and you may get that disease. So that's endemic. It's, all, it's always present. All right. Now, let's look at sporadic. Okay. Looks like no one here has that disease but one little case there and one little case there. So when it's sporadic, it really is what? Sporadic. It's not endemic, right? Because most of everybody does not have that disease. You just have a few new cases. That is it. A few isolated cases, like hantavirus. Okay, so in the U.S., hantavirus, okay, spread by mice and fleas. It's said to be sporadic. It's not endemic. There's a few cases here, a few cases there. But if you go to certain places like out west, you may not get hunter virus. Because it's said to be what? Sporadic. As far so good? Alright. Now what about epidemic? Oh boy. Highly localized. Okay, so highly localized. What's the key here? Anything else? It's an epidemic. <coughs> the normal range is the entire continent, but there's no, there's like the, the new cases are all grouped locally somewhere. Like there's an outbreak of something. Okay. And it's always latent in the population, but something triggers an outbreak. Okay, okay. So in your epidemic, you have a large increase, here's the deal, in new cases. A large increase in new cases. But if you look at our map, this color here means that, okay, that's the normal range, right? That's the normal range. But if you have those spots, if those spots exceed the normal range for that given year, for that given population, it is said to be an epidemic. Now, epidemics do not depend on the actual numbers. In other words, you can have 1,000 new cases or 100 new cases. Make sense? It just means your new cases have exceeded the normal range. That's it. So it can be 100 new cases or 1,000. The number does not matter. As long as the number of cases exceed what? The normal range for that area. Make sense? That is your epidemic. All right. Now, here's your pandemic. So what's going on in your pandemic? It's a lot more than normal. Multiple epidemics. It's a whole epidemic. It's It's Multiple nations, like multiple continents, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. I see two continents affected, correct? Do you? Yeah. So in the pandemic, it's an epidemic that's what? World. Out of control. Wow. It is out of control. So basically, swine flu, right? That was a pandemic a few years ago, right? Yeah, that was a pandemic. It started in Asia, right? But it worked its way over to our side, and it was a pandemic. So it started in Asia as an epidemic, right? Came over here. 
pandemic. Basically, what for airplanes, stuff like that. No. So make sure you have a good handle on these terms in terms of what they mean. Okay. All right. Now, I thought this was pretty cool. Okay. What is going on here? In other words, this slide is telling you if you ever had a disease on this chart, your doctor has to report to the CDC. In other words, you become a number oh, wow. for that year. These are basically the nationally notifiable infectious diseases. If you, had, if you had anything on this chart, and by law, your doctor has to report your case to the CDC, and for that year, you are a statistic. So you end up being a number on the line graph, for example, for that year. Okay. So hopefully none of you ever had dengue fever or cholera, botulism, okay? If you did, you end up being a number that year, makes sense? Your doctor will have to report your case to the CDC, and you are a statistic. Just FYI. Is there a price for it? Can we put your name to it? Do they give a price? They don't put your name. So in other words, this is this will happen to you. Okay, you end up here, right? You end up here. Uh -huh. You end up on that line. That's what happens. You don't get a name hat attached to it, but you end up on new cases for that year or that given disease. Okay, so that was pretty cool. Okay, but going back to more stuff, we'll end with nosocomial infection. Look, I don't have a definition here, but what's a nosocomial infection? Hospital acquired. Yeah, hospital acquired infection. That was on the practice. That was on your review sheet? Yeah, because it was on the bill test tomorrow. Okay. In terms of. That's why you feel like sharing now. Well, it's out there now. It was on the review sheet, right? It was on the review sheet. Okay, so it's a hospital acquired infection. Where do they come from? You've got three kind of sources, right? Exogenous, endogenous, and iatrogenous. Oh, no, my crisis. Exogenous, this is where you go into the hospital, right? And you get some pathogen from the hospital. You bring it home. Yeah, or you bring it home. Mm. So you go to the hospital, and you acquire some pathogen at the hospital. You may bring it home when you get stuck in the hospital with that pathogen. That's exogenous. And though he's going to take you back. Now, where are you getting it from? <laughs> okay, well, let's think. The hospital is full of sick people, right? <laughs> Exactly. And many of them have pathogens. Also, many people in the hospital are being treated with antibiotics, which means you are raising the increase of antibiotic resistant bacteria like Staphylococcus or Enterococcus, right? All those guys. Lots of them are resistant to many antibiotics. They come from the hospital. So you're more likely to get MRSA at the hospital than at your house. Make sense? Of course, the doctors touch you, right? Nurses touch you. Okay, staff may come in and talk to you. Okay, go. Endogenous. This means what? Within, right? This means you've already had the bacteria, right? This is basically what your normal floor, right? It's already with you. So you take it to the hospital. Well, you take it to the hospital, but it's, it doesn't work like that. So okay. an endogenous, it's your normal floor. It's your microbiota. It's your opportunistic. Yeah, this is your opportunistic bacteria. Like in other words, you're in the hospital, and let's say you're doing chemotherapy. If you're undergoing chemotherapy, your immune system is now what, lowered, which means now any pathogen, I don't want to say pathogen, any opportunistic pathogen now has the opportunity to overgrow and cause disease. Or let's say you're immunocompromised, like you're an elderly patient in the hospital, you're immunocompromised, your normal flora can overgrow and cause disease. So that's your endogenous. It comes from you. But in the hospital, they have the opportunity to overgrow either antibiotics or chemotherapy, for example. Now what about this iatrogen? Oh, boy. It come, this word means from the doctor. So the doctor made you sick. What happened here? It is a result of modern medical procedures, basically phlebotomy, catheters, any kind of invasive procedure, any kind of endoscopy, anything that goes into your body, surgery, anything that's invasive, that is a possibility of getting infected with some pathogen in the environment. So this word here, iatrogenic, means from the doctor from medical procedures. You basically bypass the skin, right? Bypass the skin with a needle or catheter, you introduce a potential pathogen into your body. So these are all sources of what? Hospital acquired infections. 
Now, nationally, they only account for 10% of all infection diseases. So I know 10% is not a big number, but this 10% of people that have infection diseases as a result of a nosocomial infection. It got from the hospital. Now, what does this chart show you? I love Venn grabs, don't you? Not really. Okay, this Venn grab is trying to show you what things have to interact with each other in order for someone to actually have a nosocomial infection. Looks like three things have to interact with each other. First of all, you need the actual microorganisms in the hospital environment. That's easy, right? Because you have a lot of sick people there. That's easy, right? We also have to get these microbes from the environment to a person. So with this, we're going to use doctors, for example, right? Touching people, maybe staff talking to you, droplets coming out of their mouth, maybe even your parents or your children coming to visit with you, right? They can be transmitting things in the hospital environment. So someone has to transmit it to you. Not only that, that's not enough, right? You got the microorganisms, you have somebody transmitting it to you, but you also most likely have to be what? Immunocompromised. Your immune system has to be compromised in some way because most of these pathogens, most of them are opportunistic. Most of them are. And usually, as long as you're healthy, right? Because the doctors only don't get these sicknesses. What? The sick person does, correct? So you have to be some way immunocompromised. All of these things come together to give you now this what? Nosocomial infection. So as long as you're healthy, right, you'll be fine. You've been hospital for a long time, you're probably sick anyway, right? And as long as you're sick, right, your immune system is already lowered. Makes sense? That makes sense? So that's why you end up getting sick at the hospital, because you're already sick. Now, how can you all, as future healthcare workers, right, if you gotta deal with this, you gotta deal with it, how can you help to lower the incidence of what? Nosocomial infections. It's real simple. It's not all about hygiene and sanitation and disinfection, right? It's all about doing what? This is washing your hands. That's it. Because you touch people, right? And whenever you touch somebody, that's how you are transmitting the microorganisms from the environment to your patient. It's as simple as washing your hands. That's all you have to do. And that will cut down on nosocomial infections a lot. Just washing your hands. It's good hand hygiene. Everything else doesn't matter. As long as you have filthy hands, you're going to transmit the organism to your patient. So that is the end of chapter 14. You will have a quiz starting tonight. I'll give you two days to complete your quiz. Remember, I will give you this afternoon your free code that has a work and kind of lie about to say you will be doing exercises for credit, but you have code. So I'll give you the codes. Use them.